Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we near completion of our discussion of the second solar spectrum. The adventure began a few months ago with the release of this video in which I mentioned that scientifically the sodium D1 line may well represent the most interesting feature within the spectrum. That is because it involves a J1 half to J1 half transition which should be intrinsically unpolarizable. Yet the sodium D1 line is clearly polarizable. In fact, there are many features of the second solar spectrum which can be thought of as anomalous relative to polarization as one can learn in this paper. Of these, the H lines of the group 2A ions are perhaps the next most fascinating as mentioned in this video. This is because they should once again be intrinsically unpolarizable since they also involve a J1 half to J1 half transition. As a result, these lines are also referred to as D1 lines at times. We will return to the D1 lines of the group 2A ions at the end of this presentation. But to begin, let's concentrate on the polarization of the sodium D1 line as illustrated in this figure. The problem of the sodium D1 line has been known for nearly 30 years as highlighted in numerous publications and several attempts have been made to explain why this line can in fact be polarized. Progress up to 2015 is best summarized by this powerful quotation. In spite of these various efforts, one kind of observed feature in the second solar spectrum has remained enigmatic and stubbornly resisted all attempts to explain it. Namely, the weak linear polarization peak observed at the center of the sodium D1 line at 5896 angstroms and the barium 2 D1 line at 4934 angstroms, although attention to the enigmatic sodium D1 feature was drawn already in the 1996 paper in Nature. The problem is that D1 type lines which have angular momentum quantum numbers j equal one half for both the lower and upper atomic levels are expected to be intrinsically unpolarizable representing polarization null lines. However, since both sodium and barium have nuclear spin 3 half, both the lower and upper levels are split into hyperfine structure states with total angular momentum quantum numbers f equal 1 and 2. A number of attempts have been made to explain the observed D1 polarization in terms of optical pumping of the hyperfine structure levels of the ground state but all of them have failed because the predicted D1 polarization is too small by about two orders of magnitude and has the wrong symmetry, anti-symmetric polarization profile instead of the observed symmetric one. In this quotation, the quantum number F is due to the coupling between the total angular momentum quantum number for the electron J as discussed in this video and the nuclear spin I. F can adopt the following values. The result of all of this is that the nuclear spin can act to split electronic levels into hyperfine sublevels as one can see in this illustration for the sodium D1 and D2 lines. In this case, the electron is making a transition between the 3s and 3p orbitals. In order to better understand this figure, we begin on the left with the two energy levels involved in the transition as denoted by the term symbol doublet s and doublet p with parity. These two energy levels are split first by the values of the total angular momentum quantum number for the electron J for each state. There is only one possible J value for the lower energy state corresponding to J equal one half, so that state is not split. For the upper energy state, there are two possible total angular momentum quantum numbers for the electron corresponding to J equal one half and J equal three halves. So the doublet P term is split into two levels. The sodium nucleus has a spin of three halves, so I equal three halves. That acts to further split the energy levels according to these F values, which correspond to the total angular momentum quantum number for the atom. This produces hyperfine splitting and only occurs if the nucleus has net spin. For the D1 line, transitions are occurring between total angular momentum quantum numbers for the atom of F equal one or F equal two, which are splitting the two J equal one half levels as can be seen here in yellow. The hyperfine transitions for the D2 line are occurring between hyperfine transitions based on a J equal one half lower energy state and a J equal three half higher energy state as displayed in red. Scientists have tried to utilize hyperfine splitting to account for the polarization of the sodium D1 line with limited success. In order to help understand the importance of hyperfine splitting relative to the sodium D1 line, here is another quotation. 
These enigmatic signals could only be explained by taking the hyperfine structure of sodium into account and assuming that the lower level of D1, the ground state of sodium, has a substantial amount of atomic polarization. Because long-lived atomic levels are particularly vulnerable to the Hanley effect, the required amount of ground level polarization is incompatible with the presence of inclined magnetic fields stronger than about 0.01 Gauss in the lower solar chromosphere, where the core of the D1 line originates. The requirement that the solar chromosphere must be practically unmagnetized conflicts with the result from observations in other spectral lines, as well as with plasma physics arguments, which instead indicate the presence of magnetic fields in the Gauss range in this key interface region of the solar atmosphere. This paper actually claims that the paradox of the sodium D1 line has been solved. In order to reach this conclusion, the authors make use of every possible degree of freedom. For instance, they utilize hyperfine splitting and anisotropic radiation pumping of the states. They also invoke magnetic fields and the associated Hanley, Zeeman, and magneto-optical effects. In addition, they examine elastic collisions and had to make use of coherent scattering and partial frequency redistribution. Use of the later, of course, is a red flag as I mentioned in this video. This is because in the laboratory, partial frequency redistribution only occurs under conditions of extreme densities or in the presence of condensed matter, both of which are absent in the chromosphere in the standard solar model. Therefore, the need to invoke partial frequency redistribution in this case once again invalidates the standard model. In fact, the use of angle-dependent partial frequency redistribution is necessary to model both the sodium D1 and D2 lines as can be gathered from this paper. In addressing the paradox of the sodium D1 line, Ballester et al. make use of a 15 Gauss isotropic tangled volume filling magnetic field at the level of the sodium atom in the chromosphere. Now this is an interesting concept as any claim that the sodium D1 line originates from a particular elevation in the chromosphere must be viewed with suspicion. If you examine this paper, for instance, you will find a figure analogous to this one, where the sodium D2 line at 589 nanometers is denoted by a band at a certain elevation above the photosphere. Of course, this is a completely unrealistic model of the sun. Given that the sodium D1 and D2 lines are among the strongest in the Fraunhofer spectrum, they are optically thick. If one examines the sun at the center of these lines, it is impossible to see the photosphere. As a result, one is unable to know the extent that the core of these lines extend below the indicated formation heights. It is therefore impossible to assign an individual magnetic field strength to the region forming the D1 line because the actual height of its origin is ill-defined. In their paper, Ballester et al. claimed that a 15 Gauss field is known to exist in the lower chromosphere based on measurements using the Hanley effect by Stanflow. Yet as described in these two videos, the measurement of magnetic fields using the Hanley effect is critically dependent on correct knowledge of the Einstein coefficient, something which can never be achieved in the chromosphere. Recall that the Einstein coefficient depends on the fact that the atom must be free from all interatomic coordination, something which clearly does not occur in the chromosphere, as we discuss when examining this image of spicules. It is not that the Hanley effect does not occur on the Sun, it is simply that we can never properly quantify the associated magnetic fields. The theoretical calculations by Ballester et al. applied virtually every possible degree of freedom, yet given sufficient numbers of degrees of freedom, anything can be modeled. So did they really solve the paradox of the sodium D1 line? Unfortunately, I believe that the answer is no. They can never be certain of the strength of the magnetic field involved at the level of formation of the D1 line. Once again, this is both because the line is optically thick and because the use of the Hanley effect on the Sun must be questioned. As a result of these problems, we turn once again to Professor Stanflow, the clear leader in the study of the second solar spectrum. In order to better understand the sodium D1 line, Stanflow in these four papers turned to the formation of the potassium D1 line in the laboratory. From a quantum mechanical perspective, experimental study of the potassium D1 line is a perfect analogy to directly studying the sodium D1 line, but with the important advantage that tuned lasers are readily available which can cause the needed transitions. In the first of these works, Professor Stanflow reminded his readers that the scattering phenomenon in the second solar spectrum is not caused by magnetic fields, although such fields can modify line shapes through the Hanley effect. In Stanflow's experiments, polarization is achieved on both the potassium D1 line at 7699 angstroms 
and the potassium D2 line at 7664.9 angstroms when irradiating a potassium argon vapor at 100 Celsius held in a glass cell as seen in this figure. 15 milliwatt solid state lasers which were tunable to either wavelength were utilized. As a result, each transition could be selectively excited. The light from the lasers was passed through polarizers prior to entering the glass cell. Scattered light was monitored at 90 degrees after passing through a calibration polarizer. The experimental setup was also modified with Helmholtz coils such that magnetic fields could be applied. The Helmholtz coils could generate fields which were either parallel to the incoming polarizing beam, perpendicular to the scattering plane, or parallel to the output beam by altering the geometry of their placements. They could achieve fields of 20 to 30 Gauss depending on placement. Upon completion of these experiments, Professor Stenflow made a profound leap. He advanced that difficulties in accounting for the sodium D1 line polarization arise as a result of incompleteness in quantum physics. At the same time, he completely ignored the chemistry which could have occurred in his experiments. He wrote, a laboratory experiment that was set up a decade ago to find out whether the D1 enigma is a problem of solar physics or quantum physics revealed that the D1 system has a rich polarization structure in situations where standard scattering theory predicts zero polarization, even when optical pumping of the M state populations of the hyperfine split ground state is accounted for. Here we show that laboratory results can be modeled in great quantitative detail if the theory is extended to include the coherence in both the initial and final states of the scattering process. Radiative couplings between the allowed dipole transitions generate coherences in the initial state. Corresponding coherences in the final state are then demanded by a phase closure selection rule. The experimental results for the well understood D2 line are used to constrain the two free parameters of the experiment, collision rate and optical depth, to suppress the need for free parameters when fitting the D1 results. The central item to note in this quotation was contained in these few lines. Professor Stenflow invoked radiative coupling between the allowed dipole transitions to generate coherence in the initial state. The question remains why should this occur at all? But such dramatic action was not necessary if he had simply concentrated on the chemistry. If one turns to this experimental situation, one begins to understand a few complications of this experiment which might have extreme relevance to the problem on the Sun. First of all, it is well known that potassium can form dimers, as one can learn in these two references. Thus, under experimental conditions, it is difficult to conclude that no potassium-potassium interactions are taking place, even if a dimer itself is not produced. Long-range van der Waals interactions are all that is necessary to confuse the issue. Such interactions might be taking place in this setting. Even more troubling, potassium and argon have long been known to interact and form bound states in an argon matrix as can be gathered in these two papers. Here is a relevant quotation relative to optical pumping, a common method in spectroscopy. When a spin polarized atom approaches another atom, for example, a noble gas atom like helium or argon, the pair can be thought of as a temporary diatomic molecule. They go on. The valence electron of the alkali atom will have its wave functions and energies strongly perturbed as soon as the unperturbed wave function overlaps the noble gas atom. The main cause of the perturbation is electrostatic potential experienced by the alkali valence electron in the core of the noble gas atom there is a substantially smaller contribution from the spin-orbit interaction. In the end, the presence of a noble gas can act to alter the stability of excited states because it is presenting an electric field to the potassium atom, which has not been considered by Stenflow. The point is clear. In these experiments, the possibility exists that potassium is interacting with argon atoms, and this acts to distort the wave function of the potassium atom. This is exactly the kind of interaction which could account for the ability to polarize a potassium D1 line in these experiments and is something that was never considered. The electric field of the argon atom matters in these experiments. The same is true for any potential electric field that the sodium atom might experience on the sun if it is being coordinated by chromospheric material. In optical pumping experiments with potassium in the presence of argon, it is well known that bound states can be formed between these two atoms, and that is what matters for Professor Stenflow's experiments. As for the experimental work, there is much more to be accomplished. 
These studies need to be repeated, perhaps with a series of noble gases, as this might dramatically alter the polarizability. Perhaps an experiment can even be conducted without argon and with lower partial pressures of potassium. These two conditions will make detection extremely difficult as the lack of an argon matrix will allow potassium atoms to be quenched by the walls of the glass cell. Furthermore, detection of polarization in sparse gases might be next to impossible. So you have to ask, what could be gathered from the sodium D1 line? Well, first of all, we know that we have partial frequency redistribution and that immediately points to non-realistic chromospheric densities in the standard model and interaction with condensed matter. That was the lesson gathered in this video when describing partial frequency redistribution at the edges of tokamak reactors. Weak coordination will end up being involved in the solution as to why the potassium D1 line is polarizable. Next, here is a brief comment relative to these transitions in the group 2A ions which, like the sodium D1 line, should be intrinsically unpolarizable. The problem has been addressed in many papers, but here are a selected few. For the magnesium 2 and calcium 2H lines, polarization is accounted for in part by invoking quantum mechanical interference between the excited J equal 1 half and J equal 3 half states as the K and H transitions are not far apart in frequency. Stanflo argues the following. When the calcium ion is radiatively excited, it does not choose between the J equal 3 halves and J equal 1 half states, but the intermediate state is a mixed quantum state, a linear superposition of the two J states. The situation is fully analogous to the double slit experiment in which each photon has to pass through both slits at the same time, or to the Schrodinger cat, which is a superposition of both dead and alive. This explanation, however, begins to fail for the strontium and barium 2H lines as the frequency separating the K and H transitions become much larger as noted in this paper. As a result, hyperfine splitting in odd isotopes of barium is used to account for the polarization. Here is the quote in that case. The polarized components in the blue and red wings of the barium 2 line are due to the odd isotopes and their hyperfine structure components while the central polarization peak is due to the even isotopes. The authors continue. Without this small but finite splitting of the interference between the hyperfine structure levels, it is not possible to obtain a good qualitative representation of the observed profile. Does everyone see the problem with all of this? In order to account for the sodium D1 line polarization, Ballister et al. threw everything theoretically possible at the problem, including a tangled 15 Gauss field, which they are highly unlikely to possess. Stenflow wanted to change basic quantum mechanic theory in order to account for the polarization of the sodium D1 line. Then, for the magnesium 2 and calcium 2H lines, Stenflow invoked quantum mechanical interference between J states. Finally, for the barium 2H line, hyperfine structure within odd isotopes was invoked. Astrophysics cannot account for the polarization of the sodium D1 line and the H lines of the group 2A ions using completely different approaches at their whim, especially when dealing with the chemically similar group 2A elements. They must not ignore that these atoms and ions can be coordinated within the chromosphere. Once again, solar physicists are overreaching in accounting for these problems. This is what happens when chemistry is not even considered. However, there is hope in that laboratories do exist and perhaps a return to the potassium experiments might serve to help resolve this problem. Stenflow was on the right track in this case because he did turn to the laboratory and that is the ultimate merit of his work. Well, that is all for now. Again, I hope that this is starting to make everyone realize that our understanding of the solar chromosphere is far from complete. So if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the works to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.